Chapter 1. Skinners The Stormwing sat on a low wooden perch like a king on his throne. All around him torches flickered. Men spoke quietly as they prepared the evening meal. He was a creature of bad dreams, a giant bird with the head and chest of a man. As he moved, his steel feathers and claws clicked softly. For one of his kind, he was unusually clean. His reddish-brown hair had once been dressed in thin braids, but many had unraveled. His face, with its firm mouth and large amber eyes, had once been attractive, but hate deepened the lines in mouth and eyes. Dangling around his neck was a twisted, glassy lump of rock that shimmered in the torchlight. Now he stared intently at a puddle of darkness on the ground before him. An image grew in the inky depths. In it, a tall, swarthy man turned the reins of his black and white spotted gelding over to a young hostler. Beside him, a girl, a young woman, really, lifted saddlebags from the back of a sturdy gray pony. When the hostler reached for her reins, the mare's ears went flat, lips curled away from teeth. "'Cloud, leave be,' ordered the girl. She spoke common, the main language of the eastern and southern lands, with only a faint accent the last trace of her origins in the mountains of Gala. It's too late for you to be at your tricks. The mare sighed audibly, as if she agreed. The hostler took her reins carefully, and led mare and gelding away. Grinning, the girl slung bags over her shoulder. She is lovely, thought the storming who had once been Emperor Osorn of Karthik. The boys must swarm around her now, seeing the promise of that soft mouth, and ignoring the stubborn chin. Or at least, he amended his own thought, the ones with the courage to approach a girl so different from others. Boys who don't mind that she converses with passing animals, not caring that only half the conversation can be heard by two-leggers. Such a brave boy, or man, would try to drown himself in those blue-gray eyes with their extravagant eyelashes. Osorn the Stormwing smiled. It was a pity that, unlike most girls of sixteen, she would not make a charm this midsummer's day to attract her true love. On the holiday, two days hence, she and her lanky companion would be dead. There would be no lovers, no future husband, for Vera Ladane Sarasri, just as there would be no more arcane discoveries for Numer Salomon, Osorn's one-time friend. I want the box, he said, never looking away from the dark pool. Two new arrivals entered the image in the pool. One was an immortal, a basilisk. Over seven feet tall, thin and fragile-looking, he resembled a giant lizard who had decided to walk on his hind legs. His eyes were calm and gray, set in a beaded skin the color of a thundercloud. In one paw he wore his long tail, as a lady might carry the train of her gown. The other newcomer rode in a pouch made of a fold of skin on the basilisk's stomach. Alert, she surveyed everything around her, fascination in her large eyes with their slit pupils. A young dragon, she was small, only two feet long with an extra twelve inches of tail, and bore little resemblance to the adults of her kind. They reached twenty feet in length by mid-adolescence, after their tenth century of life. Numer, Dane, Taka and Kitten, welcome! A tall black-haired man with a close-cropped beard, wearing blue linen and white silk, approached the new arrivals, holding out a hand. The swarthy man gripped it in his own with a smile. As the young dragon chirped a greeting, the basilisk and the girl bowed. Jonathan of Conte, king of Tortal, put an arm around mage and girl and led them away, saying, Can you help us with these wyverns? Basilisk and dragon brought up the rear. Something tapped the storming side. A ball of shadow was there, invisible in the half-light except where it had wrapped smoky tendrils around a small iron box. The storming brushed the latch with a steel claw, the top flipped back. Inside lay five small, lumpy, flesh-colored balls. They wriggled slightly as he watched. Patience, he said. It is nearly time. You must try to make your mistress proud. Mortals approached from the camp. They stopped on the far edge of the Stormwing's dark pool. The image in it vanished. Two were Copper Islanders. They were dressed in the soft boots, flowing breeches, and long over-tunics worn by their navy the elder with a copper breastplate showing a jaguar leaping free of a wave, the younger with a plain breastplate. The third man, a scanner and shaman mage, was as much their opposite as anyone could be. His shaggy blonde mane and beard were a rough contrast to the greased complex loop of the islander's black hair. 
Hot though it was, he wore a bearskin cape over his stained tunic and leggings, but never sweated. Few people ever looked at his dress. All eyes were drawn to the large ruby set in the empty socket of one eye. The other eye glittered with cold amusement at his companions. Still watching Solomon and the girl? asked the senior islander. My king did not send us for your private revenge. We are here to loot. The central cities of Tortal are far richer prizes than this one. You will have your richer prizes, Osborne said coldly, after Legan falls. It will take all summer to break Legan, argued the islander. I want to reunite my fleet and strike Port Cayen now, unless your spies have lied. My agents can no more lie than they can unmake themselves, replied the Stormwind coldly. Then an attack from my fleet of full strength will take port and capital. I want to do it now, before help comes from the Yemeni Islands. Osborne's amber eyes glittered coldly. Your king told you to heed my instructions. My king is not here. He cannot see that you forced us into a fruitless siege, only to lure a common-born man and maid into a trap. I- The Stormwing reached out a wing to point at the angry islander. The black pool on the ground hurled itself into the air. Settling over the man's head and shoulders, it plugged his eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. He thrashed, ripping at the pool. It reshaped itself away from his clawing hands, flowing until it pinned his arms against his sides. The onlookers could hear his muffled screams. When the man's thrashing ended, Osorn looked at the remaining islander. Have you questions for me? The younger man shook his head. Droplets of sweat flew from him. Consider yourself promoted. Bury that, the storming ordered, meaning the dead man. He looked at the scanner and shaman mage. What do you say, Inra Hedentra? The man grinned. Crimson sparks flashed in his ruby eye. My master sent me to see that total is stretched thin, he said in a cracked voice. Where our forces go is no matter. So long as this bountiful realm is weak as a kitten in the spring. Wise, Osorn remarked with a shrug of contempt. Fire blazed out of the ruby, searing Osorn's eyes. He covered his face with his wings, sweat pouring from his living flesh, but the agony went on and on. A harsh voice whispered, Remember that you are no longer Emperor of Karthik. Take care how you address me. The pain twisted and went icy, chilling Osorn from top to toe. Each place where his flesh mixed with steel burned white hot with cold. The power for which I plucked one eye out of my own head is enough to defeat the magic of a Stormwing even one so tricky as you. When Osorn's vision cleared, he was alone with the dark pool on the ground and the shadow next to him. I'll gut you for that, Inar, he whispered, looking at the box, but not before I settle my score with Varela Dane and the one-time Aram Draper. Grabbing his iron box in one claw, he took off, flapping clumsily into the night sky. Two days later, the girl and the man who had drawn Osorn's attention hovered over a cot in a guard tower at Port Legan. Their eyes were locked on the small blue-white form curled up in a tight ball at the cot's center. The dragon's immature wings were clenched tight on either side of her backbone. The tall gray basilisk Taka was there as well, gazing through a window at the courtyard below. I don't like her color, Dane said. She's never been that shape before. Pale blue, yes, but going white along with the blue? It's as if she's turning into a ghost. She is weary, replied the basilisk, turning away from his view. For a dragon as young as Sky Song, the effort of will required to send a wyvern about his business is tiring. She will be fine when she awakes. What if the wyverns return before then? Numerous elements showed the effects of the spring's fighting more than Dane or Taka. Too many nights with little or no sleep had etched creases around his full, sensitive mouth and at the corners of his dark eyes. For all that he was only thirty, there were one or two white hairs in his crisp black mane of hair. The king was unpleased when I attempted to fight them last time. Dane smiled. Unpleased described King Jonathan's reaction to Numer's use of his magical gift on wyverns, as well as Breeze described a hurricane. You were ordered to keep your strength in reserve she reminded him. Archers can do for wyverns as well as you, and there might come something archers can't fight. Then he'll need you. The wyvern should not return for at least a day, the basilisk added. They too used up their strength, 
to defy a dragon's command for as long as they did. I can't believe they ran. Dane pushed her tumble of smoky brown curls away from her face. She's not even three years old. She and Kitten had risen at sunrise to handle the attacking wyverns. There had been no time to pin up her hair or even to comb it well. With a sigh, she picked up her brush and began to drag it through her curls. Numer watched her from his position next to the sleeping dragon. He could see weariness in Dane's blue-gray eyes. The two of them had been in motion since the spring thaws, when Tortle's foreign enemies, an alliance of Copper Islanders, Carthage rebels, Scandron raiders, and untold immortals, had struck the northern border, western coast, and a hundred points within the realm. With the wild magic that enabled Dane to ask the animals and birds of Tortle to fight the invaders, kittens dragon-powered, to cause ability to turn any who vexed him to stone, and Numer's own great magical gift, they had managed time after time in the last twelve weeks to stave off disaster. Port Legan was their most recent stop. The four had ridden all night to reach the king. Remembering that ride just two days ago, Numer wondered how much more of this pace they would be able to stand. The rest of the country was in little better shape. Our true allies are pressed to the wall, King Jonathan had told them over supper on the night of their arrival. Marin, Gala, Tyra, immortals hit them at the same time they hit us. Emperor Kadar does his best to guard our southern coast, but he's got a rebellion on his hands. The Emperor of the Yamini Islands has promised to send a fleet, but even when it comes, it will be needed to relieve the siege on Port Cain and on Chorus. Kin stirred in her sleep, interrupting numerous thoughts. Shh, he murmured, stroking her. The dragon twisted so that her belly was half exposed, and quieted again. A boy stuck his head in the open door. Excuse me, my lord Numa, lady, um, uh, sir. His confusion over the proper title for a basilisk was brief. His majesty needs you now, up on the coast wall, the northwest drum tower, if you'll follow me. Now what was in the looks Dane and Numa exchanged before the girl remembered the dragon. Kitten, I will remain with Sky Song, Taka assured her. Dane stood on tiptoe to pat the immortal's cheek. You're fair wonderful, Taka. She and Numer followed the runner at a brisk walk. A man, a commoner by his sweat-soaked clothes, knelt at the king's feet, drinking greedily from a tankard. Beside him was a tray with a pitcher and a plate of sliced bread, meat, and cheese. The king, in tunic and breeches of his favorite blue and a plain white shirt, leaned against the tower wall, reading a grim sheet of parchment. In direct sunlight, Dane could see that Jonathan had also acquired some white threads in his black hair since the arrival of spring. This is Ulmer of Greenhall, a village southeast of here, the king said when he saw them. He has ridden hard to reach us, and his news is... unsettling. Watching the man eat, Dane realized he didn't yield just from reverence to his monarch. Gray with exhaustion, he was too weak to stand. It seemed that all he could manage was to chew his food. Unsettling? I don't like the sound of that, Numer remarked. The village headman writes that five things came out of the coastal hills near Greenhall the day before yesterday. They kill what they touch. Skin em with magic, Ulmer interrupted. Can't shoot em. He refilled his tankard with trembling hands. I mean, you can, but it does them no hurt. Swords, axes. He shook his head. Realizing that he'd interrupted the king, he ducked his head. Begging your pardon, sire. It's all right, Ulmer. To Numer and Dane, Jonathan added, Sir Halleck of Fife Nenim went to fight them at sunset yesterday. They killed him. He grimly rolled up the parchment. Fortunately, the Skinners don't move after dark and are slow to start in the morning. They seem to need to warm up. The people of Greenhall have fled, but there are rich fields in this part of the realm, as you know. We will need those crops this winter. He looked at Numer, then at Dane. I'm sorry. I know you're exhausted, but... You need your other mages to deal with the enemy fleet and the siege, Numer said. This is why you've kept me in reserve, your majesty. The wyverns... The runner who had brought them said. He blushed when the others looked at him. Dane understood his worry. Dane understood his worry. The giant, winged, legless dragons breathed the yellow fog that gave humans a dry, long-lasting cough and made the eyes burn and blur. The crew of one of the great catapults, breathless and half-blind, had dumped a boulder among their own soldiers. Legan's only insurance against another wyvern attack was Kitten. 
Wyverns might resist, but they had to obey an order from one of their dragon cousins. Kit stays, the girl said firmly, looking at the king. Takal knows more about helping her than I do, anyway. She won't protest? Jonathan asked. He knew the young dragon well. Dane shook her head. She doesn't like us being apart for long, but she's gotten used to it since the war began. Sometimes we're more useful when we're apart. I'll guide you to home. Ulmer tried to get up and failed. There's no need, said Numer gently. If you do not object, I'll take the knowledge of the route to your village from your mind. You're in no condition to ride. I'll pack for us both and give the word to Dika, Dane said. Meet you at the stable soonest. She turned to go. A hand grabbed her sleeve. Puzzled, she looked at the king. Be careful, he said, giving her the parchment letter. These skinners sound like nothing that anyone has encountered before. Dane smiled at this man whom she had served with love and respect for the last three years. Numer will set them to rights, Majesty, she said. Just make sure you're still here when we come back. I think we can manage that, the king replied and released Dane's sleeve. Unless they get reinforcements, we can hold them all summer if we must. He and Dane tapped their own skulls with closed fists, their version of knocking on wood. Look at the bright side. It's Midsummer's Day. Maybe the gods will throw some luck at us. It's summer. You know, I'd fair forgotten. Dane smiled wryly. Maybe I'll look in a pond along the way and find out who my true love will be. Jonathan laughed. Dane grinned, bowed, and trotted off, waiting until she knew he could no longer see her before she let her smile fade. With Numer's magical gift to hide their presence, there would be no problem in leaving the city. It was how they'd entered it in the first place. Her concern was for the king, and for the queen commanding at an embattled capital. For Alana of the Lioness, the king's champion, in the far north since the spring. For the many friends she had made all over Tortle. We need midsummer luck for fair, she thought, returning to their rooms. All along, the enemy's known what we're about to do before we do it. We need luck to counter him, and luck to find his spies. I don't know where it's to come from, but we need it soon. They left Port Leggins separately. Numa rode his patient gelding spots, carrying his pack and Dane's. While two of the three roads that led into the city were still open, they were unsafe. He cloaked himself in spots magically, as he'd done on the way into Legan. Dane herself flew out in the shape of a golden eagle to see if she could find the skinners and get an idea of what she and Numa were up against. She soared on columns of warm air that rose from the land. From the upper reaches, the walled city and its surroundings looked much like a wonderfully detailed map. The enemy's main camp lay a few miles off the north road. On the road itself, a mixed band of enemy soldiers and immortals was camped. On the eastern and southern roads, soldiers in tortling colors had dug in to keep the way open for help and supplies. From aloft, she also saw the motley fleet that waited outside Legan, thwarted from entering the harbor by the great chain stretched across its mouth. In her years in Tortle, she had lived among warriors and mages, and could read a battle situation like a book. What she read now gave Dane hope. The enemy army was about equal to Legan's. If they had any magical surprises, they would have used them before. With armies that were matched, and neither side having the advantage of magic or weapons, the battle on land and at sea was a stalemate. The king was right. Legan might hold all summer, particularly if they could keep at least one road open. She wheeled, turning her eyes east. Twenty miles from the city, a wide swath of pale brown, black, and gray, naked of greenery, straddled the east road. Trees stripped of leaf and bark thrust into the air like toothpicks. As she approached, she saw, and smelled, corpses, most of them animals, bloated and stinking in the heat. They came in all sizes, from the smallest mice to cows and sheep. The closer Dane came to that dead zone, the fewer animal voices she heard. Most of the beast people who could do so had fled. Gliding over the last bank of living trees, she found the Skinners. There were five in all wet, flesh-colored, two-licker things. They had no eyes, ears, noses, or mouths, but they didn't seem to require such niceties. They forged ahead blindly, touching anything that lived. When they did, plants became dull instead of glossy. Tree bark vanished. Within seconds, vegetation went dark, brittle, dead. As the creatures touched things, parts of their own flesh changed color. Brown, green, reddish, like bark or leaves in texture. Those patches would grow, shrink, and vanish rapidly. 
She had come upon the Skinners as they worked their way through a village. They ignored small obstacles, like tossed aside buckets or sacks of food that had been left in the street. If the object was big, a well or an abandoned wagon, they split up, walked around, and rejoined to walk abreast once more. High overhead, Dane reached into the copper fire of her wild magic. Gripping it, she cast it out like a net, letting her power fall gently onto the Skinners. She didn't expect it to stop them. Wild magic only helped her shapeshift and talk to the people. Still, if wild magic was something she had in common with these things, perhaps they could talk. Perhaps she could get them to break off their mindless, deadly ramble. Her net touched something, and suddenly a hole yawned in the center of her magic. She felt the closeness of things she couldn't name. They shifted and rolled just at the corner of her mind's eye. Creatures that should not exist wailed in voices that made her ears bleed. Dreadful scents reached her nose and tore at the delicate tissues inside. She lost control over her eagle body and dropped. In losing her form, she broke the magic's grip. Frantically, Dane shifted into the first shape that came to mind. Just before she hit the ground, crow wings grabbed the air and dragged her aloft. When she was safe in the new form and out of reach, she looked down. The Skinners had formed a circle. Their eyeless heads were turned up as if they could see her. She scolded with the excitement of fear, cursing them in a crow's beautifully nasty vocabulary. Her foes were not impressed. Spreading out in a line, they began to march forward. Dane shuddered. What did she sense? What were those things made of? She would have to ask Numer. For now, she slowly made herself an eagle again. A bird of prey was a better glider than a crow, and she needed the eagle's sharp eyes. Below, the monsters lumbered on. The leftmost skinner was about to step over a small hutch when it stopped. Bending down, it grabbed at the small door, yanking it off its hinges. A rabbit streaked by on its way to freedom. Before Dane could even guess what was happening, the skinner seized its prey and held up its prize by the ears. The hair convulsed. Its fur and hide vanished, ripped off in an eye blink. Patches of fur appeared all over the skinner, dull against the gleaming stickiness that was its own flesh. The hair now dangled, motionless. The thing dropped it and touched a patch of fur that had appeared on its belly. The patch grew, then shrank, and was gone. Horrified, Dane called up her magic again, while the Skinners walked on. She searched the village for more abandoned animals. There was a chicken coop on the edge of town. Its occupants could sense nearby monsters. They shrieked their alarm. She didn't stop to remember that she despised chickens for their stupidity and their smell. Once more she dropped, taking on her true shape as soon as she touched the ground. Fumbling at the rope latch on the coop, she glanced around. More than anything, she wanted to see the Skinners before they saw her. The rope gave. Chickens erupted from the coop, showering Dane with feathers, scratching her and squawking in her ears. Stop it, you idiotic birds, she whispered. Shut up, clear out, and get away from here. She used her magic to give them brief wisdom. The chickens raced into the forest, away from the approaching monsters. Dane took eagle shape for the third time, watching the Skinners from high above as she waited for Numer to arrive. He threw off his cloaking spell when he and Spots reached the dead zone, and Dane glided down to meet him. Taking her pack, she dressed behind a tree as she reported what she had seen. When he dismounted, she unsaddled Spots and sent the gelding into the still-living woods, out of the Skinner's path. Numer passed her crossbow and quivered to her. Can we beat them? he asked. Dane's blue-gray eyes met his dark ones. I don't know, she said truthfully. I've never seen the like of these things. Putting a foot in the crossbow stirrup, she drew the bowstring until it hooked over the release. The man sighed and dropped his cloak over their packs. Black fire that sparkled with bits of white appeared around his body. Give me that quarrel, he said, holding out a hand. She obeyed, passing over the bolt that she'd been about to load. He closed long fingers around it, lips moving, then handed it over. Dane placed the quarrel in the clip, then led him to their quarry. The Skinners had finished with the village of Greenhall and had entered a nearby peach orchard. Half of the trees were stripped of their bark. Even the green fruit had lost its skin. Numer looked ill. Is it all like this? he asked. Worse. There's acres of it, clean back to the hills. She raised the bow to her shoulder, taking deliberate aim. The skinners, in the middle of the orchard, turned to stare at them, if they could stare. Dane shot. The quarrel flew straight and buried itself in one skinner's head. Numer gestured. An explosion tore the air. The Skinner blew apart, showering its companions with pieces of itself. 
The others looked around in apparent confusion. Dane started to grin, but stopped. Swiftly, each of the Skinner chunks doubled, redoubled, and spread. Each sprouted a pair of stumps to stand on and stretched. Now there were ten Skinners, five large and five smaller ones. Their attention fixed on her and Numer, they came at a run. Dane slipped another bolt into the clip of the bow. The mage raised a hand. Blackfire jumped away from him and swept over the monsters, pulling them into the air. The Skinners thrashed and broke through his control, hurtling to the ground. Slowly, they got up. I hope the owner of this orchard forgives me, muttered Numer. Stretching out his hands, he shouted a phrase that Dane couldn't understand. The ground before the advancing Skinners ripped open. They dropped into the crevice. Numer trotted toward it, Dane right behind him. If I can seal them into the earth, that may be the end of it. I certainly hope so. Holding at the edge of the crack, they peered in. I hate simply blasting them with raw power like this. There is always a spell to uncreate anything, though the consequences may be... Oh dear. The Skinners were climbing the sides. Numer jerked Dane back, shouting a word that made her ears pound. The earth rumbled, knocking them down. The crack sealed. Please, goddess, please, my thrust, let that stop them whispered Numer. Sweat dripped from his face as Dane helped him to stand. Grant a boon on Midsummer's Day. Dane heard something behind them and whirled. Ten feet away, crude hands erupted through dirt. Numer! she cried, and shot the emerging Skinner. Unmagicked, her bolt had no effect. The creature rose from the ground as if it climbed a stair. Numer cried out an old thack. The creature that Dane had shot turned to water. The man whirled to do the same to another Skinner. Half out of the earth, it dissolved. Five spots near them exploded as Skinners leaped free of the ground. Dane screamed. Numer reached to pull her closer and discovered that someone else had the same idea. Two pairs of hands clutched the girl by the arms, dragging her into a patch of air that burned silvery white. No! shouted the mage, wrapping both arms around Dane. The phantom hands continued to pull. Sinking into white pain, Dane heard a man shriek, Curse you! Follow them! Follow! 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 Unseen by her or Numer, an inky shadow leaped free of the grass to wrap itself around her feet. Girl man and shadow vanished into bright air. Every inch of her throbbed. Hands gripped her. She fought. The Skinners! They'll kill Numer! They'll kill the people! They'll kill the crops! Let me go! A female voice, one that she knew, said, If she doesn't rest, she won't heal. He's just as bad. Both keep fretting about those monsters. I'd best take care of it, then. The second gravelly voice was even more familiar. Why? The speaker was an unknown male. The immortal affairs to mortals. Nonsense, barked the gravel voice. Whiskers tickled her face. A musky scent that she knew well filled her nose. Listen, Dane. Numer is here with you. He's safe. I'll fix those skinners. I can handle them. Now rest and stop fussing. She sneezed. All right, Badger. If her old friend the Badger God said that things would be taken care of, she could believe him, even if all this was only a dream. The woman's voice was fading. I'll tell Numer. The next time Dane woke, the pain gnawing at her had turned to a dull, steady ache. Cloth rustled nearby. The faint odor of sweet pea and woods lily filled her nose. Like the female voice she'd heard, she knew that scent well. She opened her eyes. A blurred face hung over her. Dane squinted, trying to see. The face became clearer. Blue eyes, a dimple at the corner of that smiling mouth, creamy skin, straight nose, high cheekbones. The whole was topped with a braided crown of heavy golden hair. In a second, the girl forgot the last four years. She was twelve again, and in her bed in Gala. Ma? She croaked. I dreamed you was dead. With a frown, she corrected herself. She knew how to speak like cultured folk nowadays. I dreamed you were dead. Sarabanextri, Dane's mother, laughed. Sweetling, it was no dream. I am dead. Some of Dane's confusion faded. Well, that's all right, then. She tried to sit up. Where am I? Sarab moved pillows to help her. You're in the realms of the gods. Moving dizzy, the girl. How'd I get here? And why do I hurt so? We brought you. Sadly, passage between realms was fair hard for you. Here's something to drink against the pain. Talk about familiar, Dane grumbled, taking the offered cup. 
With each swallow, she felt an improvement. By the time she'd swallowed all the liquid, her pain was nearly gone. Your messes have gotten better, she remarked with a grin. It's the herbs here. Sarah pinched Dane's nose gently. They're stronger. Open your eyes wide. She used her fingers to pull back Dane's eyelids. Where were you born? Snowsdale and Gala. Why are you asking? To see if your mind's unhurt, though it being you, I wonder if I'll be able to tell. Ma! Squeaked Dane with laughing outrage. How old are you? Sixteen. Memory returned in a rush. Where's Numer? The Skinner's... Her mother stopped her from getting up. Easy. Master Numer is here, and safe. The badger took care of those skinning monsters. He turned them to ice, and they melted. They won't trouble anyone now. So I didn't dream that. Dane sank back against her pillows gratefully, fingering the heavy silver badger's claw that hung on a chain around her neck. Where did they come from, do you suppose? You know as much as me, was the reply. I've never seen the like of them. Sarah, The voice coming from the next room was deep, male, and unfamiliar. The woman's face lit up. In here, my love. She's awake. The door opened and a man dressed in a loincloth entered. Although the doorway was unusually large, the crown of antlers firmly rooted in his brown, curly hair forced him to duck to pass through. He was tan and heavily muscled, with emerald eyes. Dane was unsettled to notice that there also were olive streaks in his reddish-brown skin. So, he touched his antlers uneasily as she stared at them. We meet at last. This is your father, Sarah told Dane. This is the god Wirin.